So this uh, idea like large uh, sculpture and sometimes you need to make large sculpture to look uh, uh, effective. I really like it medium size to be able to be efficient, but to be presentable, sometimes you need large pieces. Sometimes I made small piece in ceramic and this large piece from plywood, I cut it in painting and still possible to be effective. But all this about mm, energy and doesn't matter what size work to my opinion. And I probably made uh, large pieces, same like I made small pieces. I always think like no front, no back, no bottoms. So, and I try to want to put so much different images. So even uh, even in the back. It's like not showing the screen. Yeah, I, it's okay, not there. But not on the Zoom, it's not showing the... It's not showing the Zoom? Uh -uh. Oh. Oh, okay. sorry, everybody. Yeah, so anyway, I only have 10 minutes. I have so many things to say, so I possible to talk. Um, so I like it, the back looks good too. This specifically, this work I made special for one room where it's been like really beautiful skylight. So I made like face, look it up. Um, and hard to really in a sculpture, but with painting, I painting like straightforward. I have this, uh, I have this, uh, idea with decoration that's uh, supposed to be uh, painting uh, break form and form sort of confuse painting and I like this duality with um, painting uh, 2d 3d female male shiny mats okay we're Works just gonna like use it like this okay sorry everybody but I'll make it bigger Hold on. yeah make the window bigger okay this is a privilege to be first, if possible, to talk right. longer. <laughs> uh, and again, so of course, like this is only for one show. There's been with a high ceiling room, but later there's sculpture moves. With large sculpture, it's really hard to move. This is what uh, difficult to me. So, but after I made so many times, so like so many small works, I feel like, well, be nice to make something solid where you have like muscles <laughs> mm. yeah and um uh but i find out this really cool um uh, possibility to do sculpture i start working with some artist who made kiln and he designed this, this idea where he built kiln i built sculpture on the kiln i'm sorry keep yeah. talking i built sculpture on the kiln and we fire it and their uh, work stay there. Like we remove like one maybe meter uh, on a pedestal, but the sort of same things. And I like this idea where right now we in this stage where everybody wanted to be part of art, you know, like this why we have all these tattoos and stuff. Um, this on it art already not cool we wanted to be participate so this idea all art goes through this uh, or ceramic objects go through this interesting transition in the kiln where like change size change uh, um go through all this fire but nobody see this all happens in the kiln so this guy uh, uh andres alik he designed this kiln where you really reveal the sculpture in the middle of a process so like all this fire goes through, it's really effective. And, and I like it, you build this sculpture and let it not care to care, you know. Um, okay, next one. Well, talking about the sculpture, what I made for this uh, exhibition, uh, I made usually couple sculptures uh, in a row. So it's easy to, so this is a similar, theme uh same size but a different a little bit different uh, like in a, in a gallery right now but it's you see this like really thin because i don't want to carry it so heavy stuff and i feel like thinner this more actually stable so that's my technique so i kind of think of probably talking a little bit about technical side this is what jennifer asked to talk about the sculpture what you make and so this couple of pictures from this process you made all this from parts, 
it's 12 percent shrink so maybe i made this been life size but after firing it's become like midget a little bit <laughs> so you need to array like made pedestals higher to look bigger <clears throat> mm -hmm. anyway um so like yeah you working like a little mm, a surgeon or a god to create like images i it's a privilege to be a three-dimensional artist um okay and later after i build it i decorate we're suddenly involved this other uh, type of uh, craft how you decorate using texture using images using narrative part and a lot of times yesterday i give workshop a lot of people ask how i made this a uh, couple of pieces it's all kind of based on the gravity so i build it uh, cut it, uh, edit like slab between, build it again, and they're staying like uh, not blue. I not blue them. You always base your size on the size of kiln. So, and uh, and do you see like line where this joint? So you're able to easy to paint too if you take it apart, put on the foam painting. Da da da. Sometimes details even better, like a full sculpture. But but this uh, did my idea. I would like to work looks good from far away and looks from from close up. I don't know if I succeed, but it's always my de determination to kind of pushing on a, some different uh, levels. Mm -hmm. And gravity doesn't work. <laughs> I almost. Finished painting and everything, and I, uh, my studio on the third floor. I live in the second floor, and I hear boom. I'm like, oh, something <laughs> happened. <laughs> uh, it's like pieces. In some way, it'd be like, I guess that he have like bad energy and a bad face. I think like, well, let's have sense. Like previous work. Uh, see, uh, well, yes, this had like sort of too aggressive. Well, I wanted to make this face because he like scare of this dog. <clears throat> so, I, well, I need to make new hat. Luckily, it's uh, easy for uh, um, make new one. So I made new one more heavier. <laughs> so they're not breaks, so I guess it works. I mean, it's funny, like people ask why you do this way or this way. It's so technical, but really it is not the st story behind like more, uh, Kind of what hard to tell. I'm usually start work not from story, but from some on on like a shape or reminder or something. But in the process so long, in the process you build it up all the stories. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, this how their work looks like in later in a room. This is what big deal too. This is, I think, this really successful show downstairs because, like, there you see so many different artists in different approach, and this each complement each other. So there's not only this part lot on you, uh, on you, but if you have like your show, <clears throat> there's all this challenging how you kind of uh, made this exhibition like with one like uh, as exhibition like one big sculpture. Anyway, I yeah. And this is last my slides. So we build, I built even mosaic this year, this head upside down. So for, the, for our neighborhood, because our neighborhood got grant from government and they're like a pay for artists to make Main Street better. And I live in the Main Street, so I guess I need to participate. So I made sign and we put on the Facebook, everybody who have broken dishes, please bring it. <laughs> uh, so we be made from mosaic and everybody bring the precious objects, but really cool. Well, and a lot of stuff I get from local artists and um, um, a local dump. <laughs> yeah, where people like we have in the dump, like if you live in the country, probably the dump, it's a really cool place to go because there are like little box where people bring it something, what, too uh, too precious to throw away but they don't need it <clears throat> so every time we're walking around village we stop by and see like what people don't need it <laughs> so i got a lot of plates from this place so and in process to building have a lot uh, uh nice uh, neighborhood energy 
and sometimes I give workshop. And this is um, slides presentation put my dealer. So she really liked to put everything with promotion <laughs> workshops and internet. So, and this is my last slides. Thank you. I'm going to read Sergey's bio, which is what I was supposed to do when I introduced you. Oh, well, too late. <laughs> no, no, not too late. Sergey Isipov graduated from the Art Institute of Tallinn, Estonia in 1990 with a BA MFA in ceramics. In 1994, he immigrated to the United States. Isipov has a long international resume with work included in numerous collections and exhibitions including the National Gallery of Australia, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, I'll get it right eventually, Museum um, of Arts and Design in New York, Racine Art Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. His work is featured in numerous books, catalogs, and magazines, including Postmodern Ceramics, Sex Pots, Eroticism in Ceramics, The Ceramic Surface, Shy Boy, She Devil and Isis, The Art of Consensual Craft, and many others. He teaches workshops and lectures internationally at museums, universities, and art centers, Recent residencies include Archie Bray Foundation, the International Ceramic Studio, Kashmir Hungary, and Gilliard International Ceramic Research Center in Denmark. In 2001, he was awarded the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Biennial Award. He has worked in porcelain using traditional hand building and sculpting techniques to combine surface and form with narrative painting using stains and clear glaze. Yeah. Well, this is a uh, great studio, actually, the first uh, place where I saw my work. Uh, 1990 uh, for uh, this European artist. And I saw a lot of uh, colors before I saw. Thank you. Yeah. So, I thank you for the studio. Yeah. Thank you for those in Zoomland. Um, Sergey just added that the clay studio was the first place in the United States where he showed his artwork. So thank you. Okay. I'm going to ask Christina West to come and join us. Is it Jonathan next? It's Jonathan next. Great. <laughs> See? Jonathan Christensen Caballero is a multidisciplinary artist born and raised in Utah. He received his AS in art from Snow College BFA. See, I always edit them to say earned. You didn't receive it. You earned it. <laughs> um, BFA in ceramics and sculpture from Utah State University and MFA in ceramics from Indiana University Bloomington. He has exhibited nationally in shows such as the Regional at the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati and the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art and Sika Annual Social Recession at the Western Art Gallery, Small and Mighty at the Red Lodge Play Center. In August 2022, Christensen Caballero became the ceramic artist in residence at the Interdisciplinary Ceramic Research Center at the University of Kansas. Christensen Caballero's work focuses on the human figure and advocates for the Latin American labor community. Thank you. All right, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Good. All right, well, I just want to say first, thank you for coming tonight, coming today, and for your attention, and I would love to share my work with you. So, um, the figure of labor in the U.S. and the Latin American identity. So, I think to understand the work, it's really important to understand where I'm coming from because that is the, really the source of inspiration for so much of my work. And I come from a place where both my parents supported our family through labor jobs. So my father as a mechanic, then my mother as an elementary school cafeteria manager. And then that kind of um, mixed then with the fact that my mother immigrated from Panama in her early 20s. And so half my family still resides in Panama, and both those things really influence the work that I make today. A lot of this work, kind of really started off in a place really out of frustration. Really, um, and every time I walk into a building or going down the street, I notice who are doing the, the people doing the labor. And I'm always taking notice, you know, depending on the person who's running the machine or the person who's actually in the ditch digging with a shovel instead. And knowing and watching my parents do these labor jobs, I also witnessed what the impact that it has on their bodies. You know, no, no matter who you are or where you come from, that really takes its toll on your body. And so I started making work kind of out of this place of frustration, especially in, in 2015 and 2016, when there was a lot of really public hate towards the Latin American community against Mexicans, especially then and Central American immigrants, trying to just find a better life for themselves. And out of that frustration though, 
it also kind of starts to eat at you and it eats at your soul to constantly be focusing on the struggle. And it was really a breakthrough for me when I started to remember what is the motivation to endure these hardships? Because, you know, our lives are not always just this pain and suffering. It is also the coming from a place of hope, of love, out of compassion, and a lot of sacrifice to try to find a better life for yourself as well as for your community and for your family. And so then there was this transition of thinking about the importance of the mother figure in this, um, which face is actually a life casting of my own mother. And then thinking about the look and that psychological line towards then the, the son of that motivation of why I'm going to that work. And so in this instance, it was a sculpture of imagining actually her on break at her job, but thinking about the weekend that she had spent with her child, um, with her son. And then the airplane becoming the kind of the hopes and aspirations, not only for her, for her kids, but also his aspirations. A lot of the work that and you'll see from the color as well as the headdress is that iconography really is coming from learning about the, the figurative work all throughout Latin America in gold in jade in ceramics and painting murals and learning from that iconography because so much within going to the public school systems, there really was this emphasis on European and specifically Roman and Greek and Italian figuration in particular. And there's this long history of figuration all throughout Latin America. And so that's something then as I got older and started to learn more about that felt much more connected to spend time learning about that work, as well as then using that as a way to then identify the people who I'm making work about. The piece that is in the show, um, Seeds of Tomorrow, is really based around the fact that I was born and raised in Utah. So then now I'm currently living in Lawrence, Kansas. And as I moved there, then I was trying to figure out what is the progression of the work in that I want to make sure that I spend time learning about then the local labor history there, the Latino laborers that then in particular in Lawrence then were actually migrated there as family units to work for the Santa Fe railroad system. And throughout Kansas is really just southbound towards Mexico. And there is a community La Yarda, that then um, was a many families that share these really cool uh, small homes. And in doing so, you know, they lived their lives between, I think it was like the 20s to 1950, when then there was a flood that actually destroyed the, the, their homes and they had to relocate either to other towns or some of them actually stayed around. And they're, they're actually the, there's about five um, former residents who are still around in their 80s now who are doing a lot of work to then record oral histories of what life was like in, um, in this community. And in those oral histories, one of the things that kept coming up between all these different people, as well as their descendants, is describing the gardens in which they grew produce from themselves, as well as flowers to beautify their homes. And that connection, having multiple plots within that town, was something that was integral to eating and taking care of themselves and the quality of food that they were putting into their bodies, but also, and this became this analogy of thinking about that work that they're putting in, that skill and labor and love for the land as well as for their families, becoming the seeds of that then are the, for future generations to then try to prosper and find a better life for themselves. And it was really important for me to then take molds directly off then produce that was named in those oral histories. Um, so some examples, you know, that they had was um, sweet potatoes, corn, chiles, um, pears, tomatoes, and a whole bunch of other things. But it was like important for me to keep in mind, what are the things that people are producing, not only then for themselves, but currently much of our produce that we eat in this country is from migrant labor. And so it still is connecting to where do our food come from and who is producing it and how is it getting to us and sustaining our bodies and thinking again, always about the, what are the contributions of the Latino community in the United States. And the mold actually of the face on the left um, is a friend of mine, um, Blanca, who also works at the Lawrence Art Center and where I got to have a residency and she's of Mexican heritage and like third generation in Kansas in particular. And so it was important for me to find a way to connect, not only trying to represent some of these past histories, but then also all those things are on this continuum of 
within how do you find yourself in the United States today? And so it, I actually then also looked up the region in which um, her family is from, um, Durango in, in Mexico, and there's uh, ceramic sculptures from that area, which then I based the headdress of hers um, from on the left side. And then um, Pedro Romero, um, who did a, has done a lot of work for the oral histories um, about his family as, as well as the other families in Lawrence, then he was um, in particular from his mother from Mexico City. So then the headdress and the color palette of the, the boy on the right side then is based on a very famous vessel of Tlaloc, who is the rain deity. And that it is an abstraction of that. Um, and when I'm using this kind of source material, I'm thinking about it as kind of an analogy to food in that when you migrate, you don't have access to the same ingredients. You don't have access to the same materials. And so you're trying to find a way to recreate something that is like almost like a memory, um, a ghost of a meal that you had, even though you can never really make the same thing again. And so it's important for me to have that like relic of that past history to identify these people and to, to um, beautify their bodies, but then also to connect back to where the roots really are and where they came from. And I just want to say thank you for your time and um, I really appreciate your attention today. Um, it's been really so meaningful to be part of this exhibition. And, you know, so many people who are in this room are this work that I've been looking at for many years. And so I just feel like it's a total, <laughs> total honor to be here. And thank you for so much of your hard work today um, and for really years to make this happen. So thank you very much. Christina A. West is a sculptor and installation artist who has extensively exhibited her work across the country in venues, I think you're the same height as me, right? <laughs> such as the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, the Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, Hall Walls Contemporary Art Center in Buffalo, Plug Projects in Kansas City and Atlanta Contemporary. Additionally, West's work has been supported by grants and fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Archie Gray Foundation for Ceramic Art, the National Council on Education in the Ceramic Arts, and the Virginia Group Foundation. West earned her MFA from Alfred University in 2006 and her BFA from Siena Heights University in 2003. From 2009 to 22, West lived in Atlanta where she was an associate professor of art at Georgia State University. In 2022, she relocated to Madison, Wisconsin to join the art faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Christina. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Such a great group here. Um, yeah, so this is the piece downstairs. You probably all have seen it since it's right when you're walking in the, the doors here. Um, so this is a newer part of a newer body of work for me. This this is um, the first piece I've completed in this way, where I'm reducing the figure to fragments and then um, suspending it with an armature so that it still has the presence of a complete figure, um, even though the, there's a lot missing in what we're seeing here. Um, so I'm thinking about fragmentation as a way of deconstructing, reconstructing. Um, just in general, rethinking forms that we're familiar with. And I was also thinking about this, presenting a figure this way as suggesting something about the gaze, about, about my, my gaze in particular, about the way I'm looking at the body. Um, so this representation isn't quite as democratic as a completed figure, right? Because in a figure where all of the parts are present, the viewer gets to decide where they want their gaze to fall and where they want their attention to go. And so here I'm limiting what's available and I'm showing you where my attention fell and where, where my emphasis was when I was looking at the figure. And so this, this piece in particular um, references a historical work the, by Myron, the Discobolus. And um, I'm interested in this pose because it's such a great example of the idealization of the body that happens in classical sculpture. So this pose was fabricated to be this um, perfect embodiment of grace, torsion, symmetry, balance. It's, it's, highly, it's a highly idealized representation that's nearly impossible for an actual body to, to hold. 
And so this, this piece is part of a larger body of work or a project that I'm working on that I call Mirror Mortals. And Mirror Mortals is, uses sculpture, video, and photography to represent the male body. And, and so many of the works in this project are a response to imagery from, from the Western canon that represent men as, God, as gods or idealized heroic figures that then become caricatures of masculinity. And so these historical sculptures were made by men for men. So I feel it's important to present representations of the male body from alternate perspectives, such as my own. Uh, I mean, my own is what I know, so that's what I'm doing. But um, uh, so as a, as a heterosexual female, I'm looking at the male body from, from this um, perspective of a mixture of attraction, curiosity, empathy, and I don't find the caricatures that are, that are available in art history as particularly compelling. So, so rather than reinforce the idealization of, of the mythic figures that I'm referencing, you know, I'm instead highlighting the implausibility of that caricatured power, strength, and athleticism that's so prevalent in them. So instead of representing them, instead I'm representing them as, as the complex mortals that, that they are. And so highlighting vulnerability and awkwardness um, along with strength and beauty. Um, and so this this piece, the the discus thrower or discobolus, is a piece that I've referenced in other works as well. Um, so this is one of my earliest video works, and so these are just a, a few stills from that. Um, and so in this piece, I asked the model to hold the pose as long as possible, which ended up being four minutes, is what he could do. Um, and and during during this duration, he was never really able to actually hold the pose, like his body couldn't actually um, align the way, way it does in, in the sculpture. And then this is on the left here is another iteration where I created a structure to support the model's body as he was trying to hold that pose. And I took video, a time-lapse video of, of the model within that pose, and then afterwards, took life casts of his body, certain fragments, so that the, the structure would become a sculpture in its own right that had these indexical remnants from that, that moment that, that, um, where he was performing within the structure. And so the piece that's downstairs um, uses scaffolding kind of in a similar way. You know, it's this, the, the scaffolding is essential for supporting the ceramic body. Um, and the, there's, there's also an awkwardness to the piece downstairs that results from this fragmentation and the way the parts are suspended in space. You know, the proportions aren't exactly right in terms of the distance between the fragments and the way the certain parts twist. They don't quite line up with each other. Um, and, and I kind of enjoy that awkwardness. And so this is, I wanted to have this in here because this was um, the very first show I did after graduate school at the Clay Studio. So just like Sergey, the Clay Studio was the first place that I showed my work. Um, and so you can see here that um, some early impulses to gravitate towards like the unheroic figure. Um, so I wasn't referencing historical poses at this point, but I was representing moments that were clearly you know, mundane and ordinary and, and unheroic, and, and they conveyed something about a vulnerability. And so the biggest changes in my newest work um, have to do with the surface quality. So I'm leaving more of my hand um, in the work, creating fo a form that has this soft, doughy quality um, versus like the hard, slick shell that some of my older work had or, or you see in the, the marble sculptures here. Um, and there's more realism to the complexity of the glazed surface. So um, there's shiny and matte sections, um, transparent and opaque areas. It's, it's like five or six layers of glaze on top of each other to create this, this kind of surface. And so different colors show through in different moments and um, it creates a modulation that um, is, is closer to, to the realism of the body. And so the, the skin here with this kind of glaze, it can sometimes look injured or aged or sweaty. Um, and it, 
it highlights the, the vulnerability and the corporeality of the body. And in this iteration in the clay studio, um, the matte glaze that I applied on top is left white instead of adding any pigments to it. So it, it, um, it's a, that white layer is suggestive of the marble sculptures that I'm referencing. So there's this fleshy color kind of peeking through this thin veil of white. And then this is just older work to kind of get an example of you know, what I had been doing until fairly recently. So more um, choosing color that more intentionally countered the realism of the, of the form. And so um, just, I think an interesting thing about this work is that it actually developed through the glaze first. Like I, I, during the pandemic, because teaching the way we were teaching shifted so much at Georgia State, we were working with just three or four students at a time during the class period. And so I had a lot more time to, to work alongside the students. And so I just started uh, glazing and testing glazes during class while the students were working. And I got really excited about glaze. And I actually developed the glaze before I knew what I would do with it, which I think is, is it doesn't happen that way a lot in ceramics. Um, but I got really excited about the glaze and I realized that this, that I needed to start modeling the figures differently for this glaze to do what I liked it to do for it to pool in areas and, and have the modulation to it. And then, and then, you know, the, thinking about the reasons for that and um, why I'd want to represent the body that way kind of came later um, as the as the idea developed from there. And then these these are some of the early versions of this newer work where I was fragmenting the body um, and then using this new surface on it. And so this was what I was working on when I got contacted by Kelly and Jennifer. So this is what they saw. Um, and I knew I wanted the figure to kind of have more of the presence of a full body, but there's something that I loved about the fragmentation, breaking down that image more for us. And um, so that's what you see downstairs. Yeah, so that's, that's all I have. So I'm gonna invite Kelly Morgan to join me. Kelly, Dr. Kelly Morgan is a curator, educator, and social justice activist who specializes in American art and visual culture. Her scholarly commitment to the investigation of anti-Blackness within those fields demonstrates how traditional art history and museum practice work specifically to uphold white supremacy. Besides her own curatorial experience, she is the director of curatorial studies at Tufts University, where she mentors students, emerging curators, and regularly trained staff from various museums how to foster anti-racist approaches in collection building, ex exhibitions, community engagement, and fundraising. Over the past two years, Dr. Morgan has become a leading and influential voice in bolstering anti-racist work in art museums. Thanks, Janet. And Jennifer Zulman <laughs> is the curator and director of artistic programs. She joined the Clay Studio in 2015 and administers the resident artist program exhibitions, the collection, and the guest artist in residence program. She earned her BA in history from Ursinus College and an MA in art history from Temple University, Tyler School of Art. Previously, she was an assistant curator of American Decorative Arts and Contemporary Crab at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Jennifer developed and taught history of modern crab at the Tyler School of Art for 10 years and has taught and lectured around the world. She represents the Clay Studio as a founding board member of Crab Now Philadelphia. So thank you. Yeah, Kelly, <laughs> let's try this. I think maybe okay. this will work. We hope it will. Yeah. And then one more thing. I just wanted to um, acknowledge that the Clay Studio is located on the homeland of the Lenape people and to pay respect and honor their role as caretakers of this land in the past, present, and future. And then... Kelly, yeah. do you want to say what we're going to do here? Yeah, so we wanted to do something different. Um, at first, you know, like most symposiums, right? It's like, oh, you have somebody do a keynote speech. And I was like, nobody cares about what I think for 45 minutes, right? <laughs> right? When the artists are here and you can actually like hear from them um, about their work. And because Jen and I, like we've worked so closely for so long, um, I was like, what if we just did like an open forum kind of conversation with you 
because we really put this show together um, to talk about the human experience, right? And, you know, to highlight the artist one, but then also to highlight you, you know, how are you implicated? How do you uh, um, attach, identify, feel, hate it, whatever, right? <laughs> like, how are you feeling in the space? What kind of burning questions, you know, do you have about things? Um, whether it's like how the, the artist made the work, how did we get it here? How did a show like this come together? You'd be surprised at how many people are like, how did you get it in the crate? <laughs> you know, um, I wanted to have a conversation, you know, with you all and even, you know, folks on Zoom, you can put it in the chat um, about what actually grabs you, you know, in these, when you come to shows like this, I think, or when you come to shows, you know, just kind of period, you know, I think we never really give our audiences, our community, our visitors time to, you know, other than like, you know, leave a little note in the card, you know, <laughs> slider, like write this in the book. Um, but I actually wanted to give you all time to express your own thoughts and feelings and experiences. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone has questions, we would love for you to put them in the chat for us or for um, the artists. And while you're thinking of your questions, we can talk a little bit about, um, I just wanna make sure I can see the chat. Can you see, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any any questions to start with? Oh, good. Hey. Leslie Grigsby. Sorry about this, but um, it was more of a technical question. Um, considering the marvelous turnout you had last that, that Thursday night with the opening, where everyone and their mother was here, it was great. It was really good. Um, coming from a museum setting, having those works be out within reach, and nobody's going to who knows you're not going to be found in heaven, but many of them being figural are balanced on vertical I assume you have structures underneath, but how do you deal with that potential uh, backing over of something marvelous? That yeah, so we'll just the... repeat for the people on oh. Zoom probably couldn't hear it. Leslie Grigsby, who works at Winter Tour, was asking, how do you deal with not having anything be knocked over in the gallery. Um, it was stressful. It was. <laughs> that was one of the first, like as when everybody left, Leslie, that was like the first thing we were getting our cut. We were like, well, nobody broke anything, <laughs> right? <laughs> we no. did have two staff, but I think Adrian was one of the people who was um, stationed in between the two most vulnerable and was, I heard one, Tiff was saying, um, what a good job you did. And then she heard you say to people, don't touch that. <laughs> Yeah, and because I mean, even, you know, myself, right, like, kind of, quote, unquote, like, knowing better as a curator, like, Jonathan's piece, for instance, and when nobody was here, and he was with me, and I was like, how hard it, and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> like, you know, and so we, were, we won't tell anybody, so I can kind of see, like, with, in terms of, like, the textile, you know, part of his sculpture, um, it's, it's amazing, you know, that we were just like, oh, my God, and nobody broke anything in the gift shop either, huh? Um, but it's um you kind of think people have that restraint, but most most people don't. You know, most we all know the horror stories of like you know the 18th century painting getting knocked off the wall, or right, <laughs> or like the really cool inter um installation contemporary sculpture, right? That somebody just go or even I'm not think, realizing that it was yeah, a particularly working at Winter, uh, Leslie. I know you have people who like sit on the furniture, right? Like <laughs> we had the people who were training their um. Uh, uh, oh, set up a tour to train them. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. Training. Oh my gosh. Training the service dogs that yes. they got up on the furniture at Winter Tour. Yeah. And what is it? There was an institution that did something with penguins a couple of years ago. Do you remember this? No. <laughs> And it was like the penguins got a chance to like visit the institution, right? <laughs> oh, and I want to say it was like Baltimore. It was a major institution, like St. Louis, like one of one of the two. Um, and I was like, oh, that's an interesting kind of thing to get people involved, right? And it's like, yeah. like these four penguins. And they, they were like, you know, observing like European Dutch masters, right? <laughs> you know mm. I, I think that it's part of the excitement of and and I'll say excitement even though for me it's like pretty stressful difference between being in a 
traditional art museum and being at the clay studio we're free every day um we're open every day people can come in and yeah we we have to sort of mitigate the the fear and the the risk of things breaking um having worked at the philadelphia museum of art i think that sometimes museum like you have to do this but it goes a little too far you know and then you um especially with ceramic artists when there's a sense of this work being related at least to functional work i've heard lots of potters who you know they may have work in an art museum and then it kind of dies in a way no i love museums i'm not criticizing but once you stop being able to touch it something changes um about the work which happily it's still kind of alive down there um but I think part of your question was how is it staying up and that's a testament to the artists being engineers as well as being artists yes yeah I think yeah go ahead. yeah Colin Fanning in the in the chat on zoom said everybody says the penguins was the Nelson Atkins oh. <laughs> thank you Colin <laughs> thank you Colin but um but no that was so true I was saying earlier like um it was one of our studio visits with uh Christina Cordova that like my head exploded like in that moment, like listening to her talk about like the rotting, right? That needed to go through the piece to make it stable. Um, and just, and again, like you said, the engineering. And I think like as a curator, as a scholar, like I'm so, I'm always in like the, you know, meetings and theory and right? right? And how does this apply to like the lived experience? And in that moment, it's like, I just, like, just Christina talks about our work, you know, just so eloquently anyway, but I was so, like, just blown away, because I was like, I hadn't thought about the layers, you know, and just how you have to know, like, you really have to know what you're doing, right, <laughs> where I think from a curator's mind, I'm always like, oh, the art, the aesthetic, right, or the artistic skill. Um, so then this week I've been asking all the artists, like, so did you have math classes? Like when you got your MFA, like, are there, are there like, is there a part of calculus, right? <laughs> or geometry or whatever, right? That's like specifically for artists, like they do anatomy and everyone's like, no, Kelly, like, <laughs> you know, you just kind of have to learn as you go. Like Victoria, um, Walton and like her partner were just like, you just break it till you make it. And then you figure it out, right? <laughs> yeah, it's your you game. Know? broke and mm -hmm. then you had to think about how to maybe shift the head a little or do something to change the balance so the next one wouldn't fall down and, and that's <laughs> yeah yeah, that worked. yeah. yeah. and his head was turned in the other direction yeah he was looking down and then he was looking yeah up. I don't know. you know and I don't think you know people always get like I think artists sometimes it can be this sort of fantastical romanticized idea right, of what it means to be an artist and to be a successful artist, and people don't always understand everything that artists have to be, right, to actually reach whatever level, you know, of success that is, right, so as the mathematician and the engineer, you have to be the business manager, right, and administrator, um, you also have to be, right, the aesthetic, artistic creativity, um, so there's so many layers, you know, plus, like, just the technical side of things, um, that you have to master, you know, for oneself, you know, so that, that I think it really puts that like starving artist um, mythology. Well, I guess that's kind of a reality, but <laughs> but in the way you guys get what I'm saying, like the way that we kind of, that that's idealized. I think the stereotype culture. is that artists aren't good at math or science or engineering, mm -hmm. and that that's I think maybe what like, yeah. like that's false, you know, or like all you have to do is be the brain you know, or be like the artistic, um, the, like the visual, right, brains. And it's like, now you're like, you're a walk-in talking business, you know, for all intents and purposes. And you're doing everything yourself until you get to the place where you can like hire assistants and that kind of thing. Um, but like, what if you, you know, what if you don't want gallery representation? You know, if you do want gallery representation, what do you want that to be like? Like artists are doing all of that. Do you want to teach? Do you not want to teach? right? Um, how do you balance that? It's not like other, I think, fields or disciplines, you know, where you just kind of get the degree and you get the job, you get the job and then you work your way up in the company, right? Or you work your way up in the field. Um, it takes so much more, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do this work and to do it well. Um, and I just don't think artists always get the credit. credit. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Good question. Josephine and then Rick. Yeah. Um, I was very intrigued that Christina was talking about how she came to glaze first. And the glaze that she shows, I don't know where she is. She's right here. There you are. Um, they remind me of skin sizes. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about your sculpting process. And I'm guessing that, you know, thinking of what artists have to do, that you had to carefully record each experiment and I just wanted to so the, the questions about the glaze that Christina West was using. Yeah, so um, the testing wasn't uh, super scientific glaze testing. Um, I was mixing uh, glazes that I that were pre existing and then tasting the recipes with colorants to be like pacifiers and, and things like very basic kind of glaze testing and stuff. Um, and it was a lot of um, what does this look like over this or under this, you know, and you know, what does that make them more when you do it like the other, and how does the glaze move over this more, and then you know, what what does a matte glaze look like over a shiny glaze, and like pieces of color and all that. So it was, yeah, a lot of um, keeping notes, um, and I'd do sketches of the like I would keep <laughs> often like I showed you a bunch of cups and functional objects, but I would do a sketch of the functional objects I was glazing and then write down each layer of how I applied it, like how quickly, what like did it brush, did it dip, was it, you know, whatever, and then um, kind of narrowed in on the result that is more like what I'm you know, to do now with more, I can predict a little bit more what's going to happen, even though there's still uncertainty and what you say before it comes out of the film. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, unfortunately, for the Zoom folks, it's going to be hard to repeat the answer as always, but um, we talked about the glaze. Yeah. <laughs> e email Christina if you want more. <laughs> Rick, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, I was really intrigued by. Um, is yeah, you want to come up here to yeah. answer? Yeah. yeah, Edward Moybridge. It's so it's so funny that you say this because I just the reason I wasn't here on Thursday is I had an opening in Atlanta for a, a show there, and I and I presented a new video that was called After Moybridge, and 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 it was a. Uh, Kind of like a, a stop motion video that I had made from sequential photographs that I had to, it was like a very direct reference, you know, where I had a gridded background and I was trying to complicate some of the um, stereotypical gender roles that he was um, depicting in his work. And so I had um, a series of actions that men did as they were moving across the that backdrop, you know, like dancing and um stepping on a lego and pushing <laughs> a stroller and you know as a whole crawling on all fours and well, yeah that's exactly what i was thinking about what, what i was looking at as you're talking was the idea of a stop motion of a series of photographs that you took to develop the idea of how the body actually moves mm -hmm. but it's first looking at the papers to kind of down that whole process it all comes back to Philadelphia. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and there's like Aikens everywhere. Yeah. They yeah. definitely love him here. And I think Papa has like the whole collection yeah. right, of more bridge. The other yeah. question I had, which was not for Christina, was uh, actually, uh, Stephen actually took me by something uh, that we said earlier about uh, agility and work. Yes. Um, I mean, you look at it two ways. I mean, um, there's a very famous sequence of uh, I would wait, dropping oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, an inch in pot, mm -hmm. literally an inch in pot, mm -hmm. the way of uh, just letting it fall and shatter. Mm -hmm. It's a way of making a political statement about the mm -hmm. idea of this this history of Chinese ceramic and all of the political implications here, too, being part of what you would rail against as an artist, mm -hmm. not to say a word. Um, and, and the other part of it that I was interested in was the job is point of view because um I mean okay. we're looking at a time when we were recognizing that the majority of the world that we live in is a majority of the world. Well they have always been that way. 
but so much of our history is conditioned by the idea of these white marble statues, which of course we now learn to always paint uh, ancient Roman and Greek times. And the idea of the color and figuration was there long ago. So it might turn out to be, it's, it's the question I'm raising for what we may be studying. Maybe the whole idea of contemporary abstract expression is the function of the United States in the 1950s, in the 1950s when the U.S. is the only thing still standing after the, the devastation of World War II. Um, and it's kind of an any historical trend that maybe the long term, that longer history of figuration that John has referred to, that and it's all exhibition out there as a sense, is really the longer history of making art and making sculpture about the figure of nature because it reflects who we are. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. With a, um... Again, to repeat a little bit, just that it represents who we are as human beings, which is exactly what we, that was, that's literally what we were trying to do with the show. So thank you for saying that. Like, glad it comes across. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think you, one of your earlier comments about fragility based on Leslie's, yeah. that's part of what makes it exciting. When you walk into the gallery and you have a sense that these things are fragile, it makes them more human-like because we are fragile. And I think that that's, part of the energy that you receive um, as a viewer. No, yeah, I think so. And I think that was really what, like how our kind of an original, yeah, like original idea Rick, kind of came out of that, right? We were talking, you know, what, five, six months in the pandemic, maybe not even that long. Um, and, you know, and we're having the moment as women, right? As, um, you know, I'm just gonna be real, you know, frank with you guys, like, you know, as a Black woman, you know, coming off of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, right, with, you know, one, a really dear white friend, and it's like, what the hell is happening right now? <laughs> um, feeling that fragility, you know, in terms of access to health, you know, that, that idea, like you were saying, Rick, right, like, post-World War II, you know, America the Great, um, we can overcome anything that's, like, weird, national narcissism that we have right um, and arrogance and you know COVID knocked us on our asses right for all intents and purposes um you know the fragility that that we were kind of forced into like face because of bad leadership you know um all in like those moments where we just stopped the fragility even in our own homes where it was like oh I don't really like my kids <laughs> that's a, yeah, I should probably do something about that, right? <laughs> right, like the way that our lives just kind of like, we just hit a wall, you know, <laughs> as a world, as a society. And so Jen and I were talking and we're just like, we should do a show. <laughs> <laughs> and so it kind of grew out of that and like actually approaching all of our artists and we're like, here is how we're feeling in this moment that we're like careering toward God knows where. Um, how do you feel, right? <laughs> what would a work look like, you know, that that really addressed that, that was really that instability. And um, we didn't necessarily know what anybody, you know, was going to make, you know, I think like Christina's, Christina's work, everybody's work, like really, I think resonated with me personally, but Christina's work affirmed me in so, in such a way, because at this time, like I do really heavy work, like I work at the precipice of like white, you know, systemic racism and white supremacy, um, and was having my own kind of traumatic responses um, to it. And then when you're like kind of in a bubble and you're like, maybe I'm reading the history of, you know, classical, <laughs> classical sculpture, you know, um, reducing it to race like a little too much. And, and I was like, well, you know, what are other ways I'm coming at colonization and, you know, how the art market kind of grew out of colonization. And we had our our studio visit with Christina and she kind of, you know, said what she was thinking about, like she's presented to all of you. And I was like, see, I'm not crazy, right? <laughs> it's not just me. Um, and that was really, you know, helpful to kind of walk me through a, a place in my own career, right? Where I'm grappling with what you're saying, Rick, you know, and oftentimes by myself, you know, so that was really, um, this show was really helpful in really like a, like a home space, you way, know, for me. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. More yeah. Philly stuff. Yeah. That idea of us being able to work together and talk through this was 
a real gift yeah between us and then also every time we got to talk to one of the artists it was the same thing you know just you, you would get off the zoom and be fulfilled, fulfilled. yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's great I think um yeah. you had a question I did I was just wondering if Jonathan you could just talk a little bit more about the those railroad spikes or the so um, and then also the wrapping and yeah. your choice of the t-shirt material So the question being more um, about some of the specific details on the sculptures and um, with with any kind of job, it's like, I think about the labors that people do. How does it also define them? How is their personal life and work life kind of separated or combined? And so I took uh, molds off railroad spikes and, and made a gang mold to then be able to press these and then create ornamentation around then the next of the figures. Because then on those uh, spikes themselves too, then, then they're also glazed with what, you know, is based on a Mayoka glaze, which, you know, really began in um, the, through the Islamic ceramic tradition and then to Spain and then to Mexico and becoming part of the Talavera tradition. And so then that then coating with some of them with gold luster instead is, you know, remarking on both the history of gold throughout the Americas, you know, and really the extraction and taking through violent means really of that gold to, you know, for the predominantly for the Catholic church. Um, but then at the same time, it's like also those resources and, you know, also instigate a lot of migration. Um, so it's like, how can then the thing that has been taken also come back to the communities that, you know, once it were. Um, and so that, you know, adorning their bodies and um, as a way to like really kind of bring it back and, um, then when it comes to the, the fiber that's on the body, you know, it's all secondhand clothes. And so then I break down that fiber and like, as an example with the, um, the mother, you know, it's like 50, 60 pairs of jeans that make up that. And, you know, growing up with, you know, blue collar parents, then I also wore a lot of secondhand clothes. And I think for then, for that reason, it also kind of was like a little bit of shame in so many ways. Um, just wanting to um, have the nice thing and have, you know, seeing peers in that contrast of when you go to school, the have and have nots. Um, and so then it came away to also signify class. What resources do people have? And what things then are they able to then define them? You know, what is this garment defining me here and now? But then it also becoming the body itself and defining that person. Um, and I think about then the binding as a way both as to build, show that strength that it takes to endure these labors, but then at the same time, then the impact that then the labors have in the muscles themselves of the body. Um, and through that, both that, you know, that binding is like strength, but also, you know, um, can be harmful. So it's kind of like the both a push and pull of strength and kind of like the impact of labor. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to our next section and we'll have a couple of minutes at the end of the next three artists to ask some more questions before lunch. So I'm going to ask um, Kelly to read Christina's bio while I get to you. So Christina Cordova received her Bachelor's of Arts from the University of Puerto Rico in oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's good. Yeah, me in the lack of any kind of accent. <laughs> and continue to earn her Master's of Fine Arts and Ceramics from New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. In 2002, she entered a three-year artist residency at the Penland School of Crafts, where she later served on the Board of Trustees from 2006 to 2010. Recognitions include a USA Artist Fellowship, an American Crafts Council Emerging Artist Grant, a North Carolina Arts Council Fellowship, a Virginia Group Foundation Recognition Grant, and several International Associations of Art Critics Awards. Her work is part of the permanent collections of the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum in DC, the Fuller Craft Museum in Massachusetts, the Mint Museum of Craft and Design in North Carolina, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Puerto Rico, the Everson Museum in New York, the MoMA Museum in Alabama, among others, and she currently lives and works at Penland. Hi, everybody. Thank you to Kelly and Jen for this amazing invitation. I think um, 
it's rare for me to be amidst a group of people that I know understand exactly what I do every day, year after year. And I couldn't have anticipated like the inflow of um, appreciation and camaraderie that would just like take over my body and to see us from different generations, from different parts of the world come together under the same language of figurative sculpture has been unexpectedly um, powerful for me. So thank you. So this has been an interesting um, opportunity for me to take this little sliver of my overall practice and try to understand it uh, for the first time in hindsight. Uh, I started sculpting my daughter when she was seven. This is a photo of Eva. And this happened at a quite difficult part of my studio practice where I, I hit the proverbial um, artistic block, I would say. I think my body, after working for many years, was overexerted. I had not focused on replenishing. You know, I was maybe on the end of that part of my life where you felt you could do anything and it would just keep giving. And so I was looking for ways to reconnect to my studio practice and decided to turn back to what I had explored during my brief studies at uh, the Florence Academy of Art, where you would work with a model and ground yourself through that practice of being in the presence of an individual and essentially harvesting that information directly onto your piece. And so this little girl happened to be there all the time. And <laughs> I proposed this to her and she's like, yeah, mom, let's do it. <laughs> and so it began. And uh, and so what I wanna show you is just, uh, I've picked all these images from you know the, the whole arc of what I've been doing for the past uh, 10 years and just thread them together. And it's the first time I've done this because I didn't have this grand view that I would continue to sculpt my daughter throughout the years. I am not very romantic about um, the experience of being a mother. You know, it's always something that I've done with more of a sense of like, let's go. But, um, but now having done it so many times, I started to realize, oh, this is, oh, this is something else. You, you couldn't really understand what was gonna happen. So this was the first um, iteration of Eva. This is called the Misla Salvaje. And um, it started to um, create this idea between foreground and background and, and this idea of, of building a sculpture, referencing as carefully as I could with the finite resources that, that I had at the time, uh, both in perception and in time. Uh, and then combining that with something that was imaginary that could extend or um, compound the, the figure. Okay. Oh yeah, you can go down. I can go down, okay. All right, so then this is uh, the second one, a couple of years later, a Code Encanto. Puerto Rico is known as the Isla del Encanto. So I took um, some copyright free photos that were taken by a famous photographer in the thirties uh, from rural parts of Puerto Rico and printed them uh, as a background. So there was a shift from the, the made um, tiles, the handmade tiles to this um, photographic polyptic background that created started to create the sense of a window and later on that window would turn into a diorama of sorts. Um, and so what I realized started to happen is that I was able to find this precious vessel uh, in, in, in the time I spent with my daughter sculpting that I could imbue with a profound um, longing for, for home. And, and that combination became, became powerful and, and synergistic. And um, it's something I've continued to explore. Uh, this one's called a uh, jungle, jungle. And it had a big um, background of a Puerto Rican jungle juxtaposed with um, a 11 year old Eva. And then the, this is a busque recoge and the idea of um, this vessel starting to speak to me. So no longer was I just needing 
a muse to get me going in the studio, but she was also um, bringing some information that I tied into the conceptual backbone of the pieces. And in this case, she um, was really curious about defining the edges of her identity, this inherited Latin American identity. And so the background of this piece became kind of like a scavenger hunt of all the things that I grew up with that I felt were um, the speaking that define my identity. So a lot of food, a lot of, you know, um, food products and, and little uh, staples of my home and my grandparents that we grew up with. And there's a lot of rosaries, a lot of like little hidden saints and, and things that were, you know, just a, a common place in, in my upbringing. And so I gave her a basket and, you know, she's a, an avid football player. So just, you know, creating this the sense of what this child could be going through as she's understanding her place in the world. Uh, then this piece was called Altar, Altar. And, and similarly, I went and took images of this uh, site near my home in Penland. And through Photoshop, I digitally inserted a number of um, symbols that created this bridge between what I longed for that I didn't have easy access to and what was grounding in the context of our home. And then I was uh, laying over these images and you can't really, you can't see what's happening, but when you look down, it was a photo of um, the river taken from above and there's some fish, there's tropical fish in there. And there's also little toys that were dropped and settled at the bottom. So the idea is that you could walk around and I looked down on her and through onto the bottom of the riverbed. Um, this is Eva um, at 13. And this piece is called Cosmología Isleña. And um, I had been uh, really enamored by the idea of um, the religious um, makeup of Hinduism and and the Balinese Hindu Hindu practice, where there's a you know this pantheon of really colorful, empowering um, deities, and uh, having grown up Catholic, my you know my go-to female deity was the Virgin, and so I was really holding these ideas both um, together, trying to think, okay, so you know in this country that has gone through so much, that um, has withstood and has, you know, been asked so much of what what would be some, you know, symbol of hope. And again, this idea of, of using my daughter started to crystallize as, uh, as this receptacle for, for this idea of transience, for longing, but ultimately for, for hope and looking into the future. Um, and so this, uh, this is my version of a contemporary deity, you know, some some a figure that um, is holding weight and is holding it with with resilience and is you know you can see the weathering and you can see um, you know the signs of of having endured, but you also see a sense of groundedness and, and determination. Um, and particularly, this piece uh, speaks to parts of my culture, which is which is a constructed of a confluence of the African, Indian, and Spanish cultures woven into one. And so the, the skirt is a traditional baule a pattern from West Africa. And the, the plantain is a staple of African cuisine in the Caribbean. And the weather kind of like what whitewashed figure it brings this connection to our European heritage. And um, I'm gonna go back here. And that um, brings me to, to this piece, which is the piece that we have um, downstairs. And I think you notice it's the first piece that I haven't glazed. And I think in a way it's the first piece where I've um, been more intentional in understanding this as a cohesive series. And so I've been thinking of them in holding space for them in a different way. And so I just wanna read you what I wrote um, for the catalog, because I think it just summarizes everything that I've been thinking about uh, recently. 
Um, I've been sculpting my daughter Eva since she was nine. This 15 year old version of Eva is unglazed and finished with burnished earth pigments, pigments from the island of Puerto Rico, mixed with casein, lime and oxides. They came specifically from two areas, one in Fajardo near the coast where the rainforest is and one from Orocovis in the mountain center. Written on her back are the words de Monte Mar, from mountain and sea, in gold, a phrase from the song Verde Luz by El Tobo, Antonio Cabal Valle, which became a symbol of national Puerto Rican pride and an anti-colonialist anthem. In my practice, the Eva is the embodiment of change and possibility. It speaks to the inevitability of transience and the inherited threads of code that perpetuate both genes and identity. This piece seeks to perform both as a symbol and a relic by holding in its materiality a part of the island that has thematically bound this whole series through the years, exploring the riches and vulnerabilities of this small Caribbean island that I call home. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So our next esteemed artist is Kinsugi Yamada as he walks to the back of the room. <laughs> Don't leave. <laughs> no, he's coming around the other way. Um, but Kinsuke was born in Kamakura, Kan Kanawaga. Japan. I gave her the hard job. Oh my gosh, I'm the worst. Um, this is why being monolingual American sucks. Um, <laughs> he received his MFA from the University of Montana in 2009 and has a BA from the Evergreen State College in Olivia, Washington. Kintsugi has participated in artist residency programs at the Archie Gray Foundation, also in Montana, the Clay Studio. Um, he's also visiting artists at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture in the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville and was an invited guest to make a sculpture at Chihuly in Washington. His work is included in the permanent collections of the Mississoula Art Museum in Montana, the Sofeco Insurance Company in Washington, and the Bellevue Club in Washington. Welcome, Kinsuke. Just... I have to do this between Christina and Tip. Yeah. You know, if you guys need to go bathroom, get a coffee, now is the chance. All right, so my name is Kensuke Amada. Uh, I live in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, I'm, tr I'm try to, you know, like 45 minute talk or one hour talk is kind of like embedded to my brain, like how much coffee you need to get and how much thing you need to talk about. But 10 minutes is a little challenging. So, um, but I'd like to share with you guys like how I uh, process my idea to my work. So some of the older work I used to do called diving series, like divers. And uh, I was just thinking about this, like I've been practicing how to talk in 10 minutes. So I was at the airport and uh, looking at this random social media and had this uh, interesting video about the, this female Asian person was doing exercise. I mean, running at the park or something. And then this uh, male Caucasian person shows up and hey, it's a nice day or something like that. and. And she talked back to him some stuff. And then uh, he said, hey, you speak good English. Where are you from? And she says, San Diego. And uh, he said, no, I mean, like, where are you from? And I was like, I get that all the time. After what, 22 years living in the States? And uh, I still get that. I mean, I'm not offended by it, but, uh, you know, I get that. And then, you know, so where are you from before Little Rock? And I said, well, Kentucky. And they said, uh, well, what about before that? I said, I was actually living in Northwest Arkansas. And what about before that? And I was at the Philly. I was like, keep coming, you know, keep coming. And I lived in a lot of places. So, you know, usually idea starts from, you know, how I felt or where I experienced. So diving series was uh, started off from moments of a diving just like the way I came to uh, United States from Japan 20 some years ago. Um, so for my experience, it's a big dive from Japan to United States. But then I was thinking about this. What about other people? How other people apply this diving moments? 
And it can be simple like going to first class or going to new job or even just waking up in the morning and get out your room. That can be a moment of diving. So I always look for something that's common than or similar or universal than different. Because these, it's when you move to a new location, it's really easy to find what's different. Oh, it used to be this, or I'm this, and they're different. But I want to stay on place that's what's similar to us, what's common to us, even we have a different background. So some other, other project during the pandemic, I had opportunity to uh, make peace for this new museum uh located in some college in arkansas and they asked me to make a piece to that the window section over there and students being gone for about a year and a half or so and uh, that was the time that students are coming back to school and uh, also that's the time the museum opens because the pandemic the whole thing got delayed and all that so i wanted to you know, instead of thinking about negative about pandemic, I was thinking about, you know, I saw a lot of kindness and I saw a lot of love during the pandemic. And I wanted to kind of remind the students about that uh, kindness and love and community. So I thought about Smarties and different color or different flavor or all that and wrapped in one wrappers. So I created a piece. We'll go down. Admit. Thank you. So I created a piece like that. So when students on the, on the way to classroom or something like that, when walk past the uh, window and they get to see all series of different color of these characters, and uh, I hope they feel you know like uh, love and kindness in the community. So that was my plan. And uh, last year, I think it's last year or so, when Clay Studio asked me and gave me an opportunity for this exhibit, I was working on other exhibit for St. Louis. And uh, uh, that exhibit, I was going to make work about, again, um, good side of a pandemic, like uh, know what we learned from it, what we are missing and what we actually see a uh, good side of a human and kindness and love. But then uh, Ukraine and Russia situation happened during I was preparing this exhibit. So this exhibit is supposed to be positive because I was rereading like a uh, little prints or, uh, you know, researching about some of that to bring that uh, something that we always had before pandemic, but pandemic kind of gave me my uh, chance to rethink about kindness and love. And that's what I wanted to do. But then the whole thing happened and uh, I was so upset at the same time, I was so embarrassed as human. Like, why humans do this all the time? It's just so embarrassing. If I'm a deer, if I'm a little bug, they're like, humans are just, get out of Earth. You know, maybe Earth is a better place without us. I was in a really sad stage. Then I have to twist the exhibit and then made all these spoiled kid with a crown on it. So a brat kit, and then and I have to kind of include that. Plus, you see, and uh, the piece looks like the ones in downstairs, uh, in the exhibit, and this is the one I have in downstairs. But this piece is about sharing. You share body, you share community, and of course, there's a difference, and there is a, a, a difficulty sometimes. You know, that's just like living on the earth with many different people with a different idea, different background. So I was thinking about that, but we can share body together, just like a new clay studio building. If we can share this building together, try to accept the difference, try to accept the backgrounds, different backgrounds to bring a love. So I thought this piece would be uh, well fit for this exhibit. So I created this work. All right, thank you very much. Our next artist is Tip Tolan, who lives in Vaughan, Washington. She received her MFA from Montana State University in 1981. 
Tip is a full-time studio artist and a part-time instructor in Seattle. She conducts workshops across the United States, Europe, Australia, and Mexico. Oh, more. Taiwan, Bali, and the Middle East. <laughs> she is represented by Tarver Gallery in Seattle, Washington. Her work is in public and private collections, including the Yellowstone Art Museum, the Ringwood Gallery of Smithsonian, the Nelson Atkins, the Crocker Museum, St. Petersburg Art Museum, the Dawn Museum, the Met, Arizona State University Ceramics Research Center, the Eleanor Wilson Museum at Highlands, Highlands University, Kohler Art Center, the Portland Art Museum, Racine Art Museum, Yingi Ceramics Museum, Zanesville Museum of Art, the Fuller Craft Museum, and the Ishan Museum of Ceramics. Welcome, Tiptoe Wind. Thank you guys for coming. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Okay. Okay, this is the piece that's downstairs called Love Song for You, Ray. And just a little background on this piece. <clears throat> I um I had a show, I made a show, and then I shipped it to Korea. Um, and that was nervous and everything, but then right then the uh COVID hit. And it was, uh, so they couldn't open the museum in Korea. I was invited not to come. <laughs> and then they couldn't open it because there was just so much COVID. So um, so that was kind of, uh, but that energetically, I just put so much energy into that piece. I was out of ideas and um, uh, spirit to get into the studio, kind of burned out. So, then I thought maybe I'll retire. And then I was asked to this show. <laughs> and then um, I, but I still didn't have any ideas. So I thought, well, well, what I need is some new blood because I was tired of self portraits. So um, I found this wonderful 11 year old gal and she was so vibrant. And so I immediately projected onto her oh, she should be lying down and playing a harmonica, which I do when I was 11. My grandmother gave me a harmonica. It was really my little private, private moment. So, um, and then Russia invaded Ukraine. And so then I thought, no, she has to be a refugee and she has to be playing for her home country. And so then it was sort of like all the pieces fell together. Normally I don't work this way. I work, I have the concept pretty, you know, figure it out before I start. Um, and then, but this one came in pieces and little bits. So then she was just playing. And I, I wanted initially to put together only slides of reclining figures because I was like a 10 minute talk uh, from all of the work, what should I do? So I thought, okay, I'll make all the reclining figures and make, make them make sense. <laughs> you know, they're quite different, but, but then you included all of the figure, all of the slides that I sent you that, that were for the book, I thought, but anyway, that's okay. But, Mostly the talk is kind of about um, the reclining figures. Anyway, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> you can see some of the self-portraits and just some other work, but I won't tell you the stories on each one. So this one went to Korea. This is a self-portrait, uh, twice life size, um, about when my goddaughter would I allow her she really wanted to mess with my hair. And she goes, oh, please. And then she put it in this kind of um, assembly. And then she'd go, oh, let's go out to dinner. <laughs> so everyone can see. So, and then this is sort of the, certainly, why wouldn't we do that? <laughs> and then this is um, when right before the election of, um, the 2020 election and I was felt like it was reduced to a primal scream and that's how corrupt I felt like our political system was how corrupt 
um, I felt like I can't really make an intelligible comment. All I could do is scream and rip up pillows. That's what I was, felt reduced to. So this is called tantrum. And I wanted to make a grown woman having a child's tantrum. That's is also a self-portrait. She's life size. This um this was part of the show going to Korea. Uh, this is a fairy tale. The show was called Fairy Tale. And I kept thinking about the president, Donald Trump, and how he's like a fairy tale kind of character, evil in that way, or so narcissistic and greedy for attention. So I thought I'd make a, a king that would send his people out to grab all the gold from the surrounding kingdoms, bring the gold back, melt it down, and make a bigger and bigger and bigger crown. So all of the surrounding uh, um, territories would see him, and he'd be you know, revered for the most beautiful crown in all the land. But then with that, the more he sent out and brought gold back, and they added to his crown, the heavier that crown would be, the more he'd be hunched over since he never took it off. And then finally, his neck would snap and he would die. <laughs> but I, I really loved making it. So that is the consequence, the moral of the story is, is the this piece was called kind of an adolescent. Uh, I, I wanted to do some adolescent work, um, another self-portrait, but not literally. But And this was what I was um, thinking I need, I would want if I was an adolescent tattoos, but my parents would never agree to letting me have a tattoo. So then I thought, well, I'll just write a tattoo on my body with a big pen and then get around it because they wouldn't see it anyway. And so this is called Letter to God. Um, I wanted to, it was had nothing but questions at that time. This was a recent piece that also uh, went to, uh, actually this was sold recently. And it's kind of like, if I hold my breath, will I rise? So it's kind of, you know how sometimes breath can let lift you, but in this case, you will die. So I like the combo of that. This was the pretty high realism, and I just wanted really accuracy, not really high realism. This was the beginning of the, the pieces that are reclining and trying to make sense out of because there's all these different aspects to reclining figures. You can sleep, you can dream, you can um, play harmonica, you could, you could cut you going, but it's a privacy sort of thing though. Anyone in this reclined is in their own kind of space. So it forces the viewer kind of to be a foyer a little bit. And I thought, um, and then I was very interested in the anima and the animus and the, uh, the notion of male and female. And unless you sort of understand both, you won't transcend. And so I wanted to make hermaphrodite and, and think about hermaphrodism. And that's what this piece is called, Tender Flood. Another reclining piece, thinking about Buddha and uh, how Buddha, uh, my thought about Buddha was he just be laughing and lying down he, as if being tickled by the universe. However, um, my neighbor was a strict Buddhist and, and, and said, Buddha wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought, but she said, there is a character in India and um, it's called Avadut. They're characters that are, are in childlike bliss and they roll in the ground in the mud and they don't care and they are tickled by the universe. So this was my uh, version of Avadut. 
this was the first pretty high realism piece that I did um, called uh, Milk for the Butter Thief. And she is, um, she has been in devotion her whole life to Krishna. Um, I, I have a spiritual teacher that's Indian and I went to the ashram to stay with her for some time. Anyway, I learned all about the gopis, which were the consort of Krishna. And they would um, stay with the beautiful, young, flowing hair, beautiful devotees. And I kept thinking, what do they look like as old women? Because I um, thought about, I always think about old women. So this is my version of gopi. And she's given her life in devotion, which is her milk for the butter thief, which is Krishna's kind of nickname. Another one, Cloud. She's about three quarter scale. Oh, this is the backside of Milk for the Butter Thief. I love her carcass, you know, I love the flesh that kind of obeys the gravity and pull pools. This is a great big 10 foot piece that's part of an installation. She was just called Africa. And she was the piece involved five twice life size uh, children with albinism, African children with albinism, which was uh, my commentary for uh, all kinds of horrible things that they're subjected to in um, mostly Tanz Tanzania. And, um, and so this is Mother Africa waking to their cries of these children with albinism. Oh, I didn't do this one. <laughs> I think the last one would just be the one from the show, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this was the last one. Okay, so this is just another view overview of Love Song for Ukraine. I wanted her to just be in that yearning for her homeland, just inside of that space, you know. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Tip. So we have uh, just about nine minutes for some more questions. So... Does anyone have questions for these three artists who we just heard from? And I'm gonna look in the chat as well. Um, you have a question, yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in you put the bill on the slide 13 there. <laughs> the one that we just, oh. yeah. Christina's. Oh, that's Christina? Yeah. Okay, Christina also used to grow one of her other cultural beers that had the triplets on it. And I was wondering, about Christina. Yeah, the set is that's um, an example of some recent work that I've been doing in collaboration with a local metalsmith. And when I go to Puerto Rico, I take photos of these ornamental gates, and they become a staple of Caribbean architecture, um, primarily in the metro area where I grew up. They were a means of protection. But you end up having a lot of conversations with people through those gates. Like when you go to your grandmother's house real quick to check in, you know, because it involves opening. So oftentimes I have memories of interactions through through those. And, and also like the idea of um, something that is designed to look ornamental, but it really is kind of caging you in and keeping things out. Um, and so this idea of putting figures behind it started to to come about, and the next generation of these go even further. So I'm excited to to show continue with this idea and show it in the next year. So thanks for asking. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking for questions on Zoom. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Chris Rogers wasn't able to be here today. So um, uh, towards the end, right before the conclusion, we'll we'll make we'll show his image and and explain a bit. 
Um, and then this one is, what shifts have you noticed in figurative art that contribute to building empathy and engagement in audience? Where do artists want to work to live in order to reach and touch lives? I mean, that's a great comment question because I feel like as we sort of said that certainly having a figurative show was largely about creating empathy. Yeah, no, totally. I think I've had conversations with some of the artists here and just, you know, other contemporary artists around the country recently about making work and engaging with institutions that now, like there's an urgency for um, that work to now do something tangible, you know, for people in an everyday community, whether it's the staff, whether it's people who live around the institutions, like it's not in terms, and this again, this is just my experience in conversations with artists I've talked to, like it's not okay. It, I get a sense, like there is this feeling or this fervor, like, okay, now it's no longer okay to just show the work. Like the work actually, ha it has to do something else. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily new, but I definitely think there's like a fresh urgency about it, you know, among our contemporary artists that I've talked to recently, right? Like it's um, it's not just enough of the work to kind of be a commentary, you know, it has to like produce something, you know, that really helps people get free, you know, helps people feel free from various types of oppression, um, but also just kind of free in their own, you know, everyday lives. Um, so Kelly and I did a little radio interview last week and someone wrote me a note because she, has engaged with the Clay Studio and, and um, talks that we've given and stuff before, but she said she was, until hearing us talk about like our backgrounds in historical art and maybe why I started to get into the field because I was, I've always been, I was a historian first and then I became an art historian interested in social art history and functional art was exciting to me and still is exciting to me because historically it helps us understand humans. You know, you have a chair from the 19th century, you start to understand like, okay, it's a chair made for a woman. This is, it doesn't have any arms because her skirts had to fall over. It has this, it creates her posture because she had to sit in a certain way. So objects that we use every day do help us understand humanity. And then that evolved also into understanding that when the industrial revolution began in the 19th century, immediately craft art started to push back. So William Morris and social activism being part of all of these craft materials, ceramics, wood, fiber, uh, metal, and glass. Oh, glass. <laughs> like, did I say glass already? <laughs> Sorry. Um, and now being excited about contemporary craft because it still has those echoes. Um, and I think that that is, part of this idea of like, it's all coming together into this moment in time when people are hungry for meaning and moving the social conversation forward through artwork. And I just love the way that's all tied together. I'm not sure if I made any sense there, but <laughs> that's why I'm excited. Well, I think, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we work so well together. Like actually kind of why we're friends, we have similar backgrounds in that way. Like I, sometimes I, well, I stopped saying it now. But I used to say all the time I get pulled into contemporary art kicking and screaming because um, I'm not a like specialist in contemporary art. I was like contemporary art was kind of a crash course for me. Um, I really like to deal with the old dead folks, you know, like, and I mean, like real old, like 18th, 19th century, <laughs> pretty old. You don't have to ask their opinions. Yeah, that. exactly. You kind of say whatever you want to say, right? Um, and not that you would say anything inaccurate. But um, it was a similar thing for me. It was like, I came into, I like to, I sometimes like to say I came into the art world or like curatorial profession, curatorial profession, like through the back door when nobody was looking. Um, so I got a chance to kind of see the colonial, right? Like all the problematic, messy mechanisms. And it was fascinating to me that there was this like superficial, you know, or performative way particularly the traditional art museums in, in like most specifically, where like, oh, we have some kind of issue with race or gender. Let's like get the BIPOC artist, let's get the woman artist to come in and do the intervention, right? So it was all of this weight, you know, put on, you know, specifically black contemporary artists, right? And like black working 
museum professionals to kind of fix, you know, sometimes 150, 250 year histories. And I was like, where they do that at? Like, how is that gonna work in any kind of way? Um, and then it got worse, right? <laughs> so it was like, now we're gonna go from like kind of tokenizing the artists to then tokenize and actual like these curatorial or like senior leadership hires, right? Um, and being one of those hires, right? And like like my first three jobs, like I got to, a, like when I got to the third place, I was like, okay, enough is enough. I'm getting ready to like blow this place up. Um, and I kind of did, <laughs> you know? So from that, it was like, there's a deeper issue you know, going on here that like, like the, it's not just that people in the field, wherever you like, whether you're, you know, working for a funding org or, you know, um, working at an actual institution or an artist, like wherever you fall in sort of the ecosystem. I was like, everybody knows what the problem is, you know, but nobody actually wants to address the problem from like its root. And I think, you know, from that 2020 pandemic moment, that slapped the field in the face in a way that I don't think has ever happened, you know, in the 20th century. Like, of course, there's been pushback against this stuff for decades, you know, but I think the field was really faced with dealing with like how behind the curve, right? They've been, you know, on a lot of this stuff. And it's like, there's, okay, there's no way, you know, you can have the big blockbuster exhibition anymore and bring people to the door and don't do anything else. Right. Um, you can't ignore, you know, kind of what black folks and Latino folks, right, have known, you know, Asian folks have known for our entire lives, right? <laughs> you know, without addressing in some kind of ex you know extensive way. So back to my original statement, it was like artists are now, you know, pushing, pushing institutions and challenging institutions um, in ways about that now um decolonizing collections you know right actually like saying like how did you get this <laughs> you know beyond you know let's hire the, the curator of color to interpret it correctly like this shouldn't even be here you know which was definitely not the response um 30 years ago you know and just having institutions grapple with that and so I always like talk about clay studio um because I think as a staff you know, you all took that on um, with the community here in Kensington in, in ways that institutions just weren't doing. You know, it's like, we, I don't think we, any of us will be here today without that shift, you know, and how you approached it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you working with us. Thank you. I think it might be time for, oh, Helen Dredd has a question and then it's time for lunch. She made a list. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, so just to say for the people who didn't hear that Helen Drett was making, um, she just curated a show um, from 50 years ago on her list of, of artists about figurative work. And then 50, did I, what did I say? 50 years 50. ago, yeah. Um, and also that wonderful comment about Chris Rogers' work, who we'll look at later and referencing your ideas that the, the hand is essential for survival. That's a great way to say that. But that you you could see the the use of of the 3D printing in that piece. So that's really that's really special. Thank you, Helen, for saying that. <laughs> 